Aloha po aono kapo. Hello everybody and happy uh, Saturday. Welcome to our webinar. Mahalo nui for joining us. Uh, my name is Napua Kasim Fisher and I'm the Education and Training Coordinator for Papo Ololo Kahi, the Native Hawaiian Health Board. And um, I welcome you to our newest mini webinar series and it's called Lilihua Hurricane Preparedness in Hawaii. Today we have Kiahi Kamara and he's going to be the first presenter for our three part series and um, this webinar series is in partnership with the Department of Health Alcohol Drug Abuse Division or ADAD and um, we have been planning multiple mini series throughout August and September that focuses on hurricane and disaster preparedness uh, and other cultural trainings. Um, <clears throat> we chose the, the title Lili Hua for its uh, definition, uh, which means to go prepared, to be furnished for the purpose, um, to be supplied with what is necessary. And so this mini series focuses on uh, preparing our lahui, preparing our community for different types of situations, for hurricane, for flooding, lava flow and what have you and um before we begin we will be doing some of the housekeeping for those who are watching us on facebook live aloha kako um the webinar will be recorded on facebook but also recorded here on zoom if anyone has questions either on facebook or here live on zoom you can um put it in the chat Put your question or comments in the chat or also use the Q&A feature on Zoom. And while people come into our Facebook uh, and Zoom, we would love to hear where you're calling in from or where you're from. Uh, you can just put it in the chat, aloha from your town, from your Kayaulu, and um, we will get started. Uh, so we have Kiahi here, and um, he's all set up for his webinar. He's Makoko, he's Lili Hua, and um, <clears throat> I'm going to have him introduce himself with, with uh, his Ho'olauna. And uh, Kalamaya Kiahi, you have to unmute yourself from over there. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, hi everyone. Um, my name is Kiahi Kamara. Uh, mahalo to Napua and everybody at Papaola Lokahi um, for putting this on. It, I feel like it's a very important topic to go over because we live in a place that has hurricanes every year or potential for hurricanes every year. So, uh, so mahalo to you folks for facilitating this. Um, and if you haven't watched Mahi Ai's video, the first video of the series, I would suggest to go watch that because he had a lot of really good information, um, just on the general preparedness, had some things in there that I forgot to put on my list. I was like, oh, yeah, maybe I should do that as well. Um, but yeah, a little background on me. Um, I was born on Molokai. Um, we moved to Kilo on the Big Island when I was five. Lived there most of my life. Grew up there. Uh, now I live in Kaneohe, Oahu with my wife. Um, I have a degree in Tropical Ecosystems Agroforestry Management. And I've spent a combination of about 10 years in different food production fields here in Hawaii. I've also spent numerous years working in conservation work um, all over the state. Um, I, so some of, some of the fields that I worked in, I lived on a friend's ranch and I was a ranch hand for a few years in Ka'u on the Big Island. Uh, we we're raising cattle. Um, I spent five years helping to develop uh, a USDA certified 
deer harvesting operation on the island of Maui with um, Maui Nui venison. I, and recently, we decided to become kalo farmers here on Oahu. And yeah. so with all of those years of seeing different types of food productions, take a mental note of, of what things in our system as, you know, as a community might need some working on, um, what things are good, and you start to take note on the people who are doing really good things when it comes to like helping out the community, especially in these types of situations. Um, one of the big things for me, getting into preparedness, especially for hurricanes, uh, in college, I, I was required to take a course uh, in what is, it was a natural disasters course. And it was a big eye opener for me. Prior to that, we, we saw hurricanes and I just, I just thought, oh, it's, it's just a storm and whatever. But after taking that class, it really made me think a lot about the different dangers we have and not to be scared of it or anything, but just to be prepared so that you don't have to be scared. You don't have to worry about it once you set up your system to manage those, those events. Um, in that class, one of the biggest things they taught was to know your risks. So wherever you live, you have a certain set of risks. If you live in a dry, arid climate, you run the risk of fire, flooding. Um, if you live in a tropical environment, like we do in Hawaii, you have flooding, hurricanes, uh, people on the continent. If you live in a certain area, you have tornadoes. So just, just understanding the risks that, that you have in the house that you live. A house in my same general region might have different risks than me. If I live in a low-lying area, I, I could get affected by flooding. Uh, where we live now, one of the major risks for us is tsunamis because we live so close to the ocean. So we're always thinking about a tsunami um, event and what is our what is our process? And you start to think, you start to come up with a plan. I think everybody should have a plan, no matter what your risks are. Um, yeah. So for hurricanes in general, um, if you you want to have well, actually for any for any event, you want to have that specific plan tailored to you. Um, and for hurricanes, sorry. Um, I, f I find for us, it's probably best to, to stay, to be able to stay in your house. So with a, with a tsunami, for instance, we would probably have to leave. So we have to have kits and preparations for us to leave our home. In a hurricane, our best bet is to stay here because all of all of the things that you buy so your food your water your power all of this they're very hard to hard to move so if you have to leave you're not taking your entire kitchen your entire shed with all of your all of your preps uh, so the best bet is to stay home but with that you have to make sure that your house is even suitable to withstand that storm so majority of the homes in Hawaii um, that are that are that were built prior to the 90s, which is a lot of homes still yet, didn't have the requirements for hurricanes as we do now. So if you're in a newer home, you, you're probably good because they require people to put on hurricane straps on your roofing um, and, a, and a few other building materials. But with that being said, even though you have an older home, um, it might be better for you to, to retrofit your home now. And there's ways to go about doing that. And I think Mahi, I left a link to, to a good book, uh, a downloadable book, uh, explaining how to retrofit your, your older home for a hurricane. Uh, yeah, so, I'll take a step back real fast. 
one of looking at past events. So in this in that class that I took, we looked at all the different past events that has happened in Hawaii and other words, other places in the world. But for hurricanes, you have this history and you have the track. They have all the track records of every hurricane, how much damage it, it does. So it did. So the so you would want to what what I do is I try to study as much of those past events as possible and see what happened to people after the fact, what was it that they that they thought they could have used, what what they should have did better, and just kind of learning from everybody's, you know, not mistakes, but experiences. Um, one of the best examples, I think, for Hawaii happened in 2017 to Puerto Rico, um, Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria. It was probably the worst case scenario for a hurricane. Um, and that's what they always say is you plan for the worst, hope for the best. So the, the worst case scenario, Puerto Rico, similar to Hawaii, they're an island, they're isolated from, from the continent. They're, they're a US territory, but they got hit with 100, 100 mile an hour winds during Hurricane Irma. And from that, half of the island lost electricity. Uh, a lot of people lost drinking water. And two weeks later, there were still a lot of places that didn't have power. And at two weeks from that event, they got hit with a category five hurricane, which is Hurricane Maria, and decimated the entire island pretty much. So, the entire island was without power. Some places didn't get power back for about 17 months. And they're like, it was, it ended up, they ended up classifying it as a catastrophe because so many, so many lives were lost and the, in, the entire infrastructure was decimated. So they didn't have electricity. Majority of people's homes, um, if you look at pictures after that hurricane, it just blue tarps everywhere. So majority of people's homes, their roofs flew off um, because they didn't have hurricane strapping. Um, and so it's it's the best it's the best example we could probably take for for viewing our islands as as a risk like risk management. Their infrastructure was was not as solid as ours. They were definitely, um, I mean, they had a bunch of, a bunch of flaws in their, in their electric system and the building holds. But nevertheless, like, if we were to get hit by something that strong, I, I feel like we could, we could experience something close to that. And even if it was half of that, being without power for, you know, eight to nine months is, is not something to shrug off. Um, so the biggest things from them, re, like watching all the interviews and reading all the articles on the pulse, you know, up to like to present day, how, how the economy is, how other social aspect is um, post Maria. Their biggest thing within the, the first year was, they didn't have power, so every time people would bring relief, so the, the rule is to have at least two weeks of food. But once those two weeks are up, you don't and you don't have power. When people would bring food to them, they had to eat it immediately because no one had refrigeration for 17 months, or a lot of people didn't have for 17 months. But the only people that that had the ability to refrigerate the food were people with solar power that, that had it installed before, before Hurricane Maria. And luckily it didn't fly off with everyone's roofs. Um, so these few homes that had solar power, like standalone solar power off grid, they ended up becoming power hubs for the entire community. So people would come there to charge their phones just to, I mean, the communication was devastated as well. 
but they would charge you know all their little battery banks to like go home and do like a little fan or lights or something so looking at hawaii that is that's one of the big things i i feel like would, would benefit is that having if everyone had solar power with a little battery backup system so you could have a grid tie system that you still run through through the electrical company but with a battery bank what not, what most people don't realize is if you have solar with no battery backup if the power goes out because something's happening even though you have solar they cut your power so you can't even use use the power at night because they don't want that electricity back feeding into into the lines while, while uh, workers are are fixing it right but if you have a battery backup system it cuts that off so no one gets hurt on the uh, repair side but your your system functions as a standalone and in that event that would that would make all the difference if even if you had a ba battery backup system that could only like in an event like that all you really need is refrigeration lights um everything else it's is more luxury but if if you can only have a refrigerator keeping food keeping all like whatever you have in your fridge now if that was to go if that power was to go out you'd have to eat everything within the next few days but if you had that battery backup system it would give you more time to you know survive longer durations without power um and you could i mean the more people who have a system like that the more buffer it is on the entire community right everyone can kind of help out come to my house if you need to store food um and not rely so much on cooling from from the grid and it actually helps the grid out a lot um the second big thing I took away from maria was water people after a few months, we're getting, we're dying and getting very sick because the water was super questionable. Um, they were digging their own wells, but it was like there was instances where it was dug wrong because it was an emergency. They just dug it, and it was downhill from people's cesspools, and, and like instead of messing with that, uh, the recommendation is to stock up on water and. For years, we stocked up on water, and the tendency is you you buy all these bottled waters, and a hurricane doesn't hit. Then, for the next year, you end up using some like if you're really good, you leave it alone. But most people are like, oh, okay, I'll take it take it to a barbecue or take it to the beach, and it's and in the next year, you scramble to buy more water. So. Looking at that, we wanted to one limit the amount of plastic we consume every year during hurricane season. Um, and that water eventually is gonna run out anyway. So you look at we looked at filtration systems and and how how do we have something that could be based here that we could catch up a lot of rainwater during the event with rain gutters and now, any any water carrying system, so buckets, trash cans lined with trash bags, and we bought this filtration system. is It's called a Berkey, and it just it just sits on your counter, and we use it every day. So there's there's these black filter elements that go into this, um, and they can filter. So there's different. There's two different levels of filters. There's Filters, um, there's filters like the life straws and and a few other Sawyers have it, but um, they only filter out parasites, bacteria, and protozoa. Whereas a Berkey water filter and a few other filtration systems, they're actually classified as uh, water purifiers. Um, so they they filter out all those things. But they also their mic their micron size so the filter size is so small. They also filter out viruses. So here in the tropics, we have to worry more about uh, about. Um, sorry, my dogs are working. 
have to worry about viruses in, in streams um, from, from pigs and rats. And so with that being said, I could take this, fill this top part up with river water and we could drink it. And it, it just, it just gra gravity feeds down. Um, it can hold up to six black filters in here. We have two, so it comes standard with two. And with those two, you can filter up to 6,000 gallons. So one system like this saves us so many years of plastic bottles. But on the flip side of that is in an event when everyone else runs out of water, this can turn into a community hub as well. Um, and you can filter 6,000 gallons for people. And it's smart to have, to have backup filters that don't get used at all. So we use this daily, that's why. But if you have at least two or three backup filters, you can give, give yourself that much more runtime. So with the amount we drink, we'll probably change these filters out every four, four years. Um, this whole system is kind of expensive. We bought this for about $400, but the two pack filters only cost about $150. And if you, if you look at it as like a gallon, like how many gallons of water you're gonna get, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's a lot upfront cost versus a bottle of water. But um, what I've seen Berkey do is for disaster reliefs, they send just their filters to, to disaster relief areas and they, they retrofit food grade buckets. So I actually got two like this. So you, you'll stack, you get your bottom up thing like this. You retrofit your filters and then you stack them. And this is practically the same thing. So for $150, if you want to go to budget route, you can have this exact thing. And for me, that like power water, and then with the power, you have the ability for food, right? So it's power, water, food, shelter. That's that's the big things to th that I think about for post event, uh, post disaster event. Um, this is another filter. It's a it's the same thing. So this is a purifier. So you have life straws and Sawyer's. Say, what I was saying is they're they're filters, but they're not they don't filter out viruses or heavy metals or chemicals. These two do. Um, so I have this as well for in a case we have to leave, say there's a tsunami or something happens to our home and we have to leave in a hurry. And I mean, this is usually the first thing in our car, but if for some reason this gets forgotten, this is always in my bag and it's really easy. So you just take this, you scoop up whatever water source. You always, with filters, you always wanna try and get clean water already. Um, if you use dirty water, you'll, you'll shorten the life of your filter. But um, with this one, you fill this up with water and it's just a press. So you press this down and with the pressure of your body, this, this side is gonna be filled with clean water. And um, it comes with a filter cartridge, this orange cartridge right here. So it's a bit pricey. It's $89 for this entire setup. Um, and this filter can filter up to 65 gallons. But in an emergency, and sometimes I go hunting in the backcountry, and I don't want to carry so much water because it's, it's heavy. I'll find a stream and drink, drink with this. Um, and what I'll do is I'll have a backup cartridge. So I'll buy this. This is $25 for another cartridge. And this is another 65 gallons. So in this little package, I have virtually 130 gallons of water. And yeah, that's that's the, the two, the, that's the biggest thing for me is water is very heavy. So a gallon of water is eight pounds. So if you have to walk, if you're if in an emergency you break down, your car is broken, you have to actually get out and walk. You're not going to carry that much water. We do still have some water bottles. 
So the good thing about water bottles in our bags is we like to use the smaller water bottles just because because it's so heavy. Um, you can distribute the weight easier instead of having one big thing like this. Um, and with the smaller water bottles, if we do come across people who need water, it's only easy to give them a water bottle and then we just keep going. And then I can always refill with this. Um, yeah, oh, so the next thing is probably food. With food, this is the traditional way you get canned goods, you know, for two weeks, they recommend. I would suggest going longer. Um, for us, we wanted to go as long as we possibly could, eventually being able to self-sustain ourselves indefinitely. That's the goal. But the reason for us trying to strive for that is in an event, there's always gonna be people who aren't prepared. So instead of having your base necessity, so two weeks, having a little extra where when someone comes to you, you don't have to turn them away. Like, no, we need this for us. You say, looking at the event, how bad it is, you have to manage how, how long you're expected to not get, you know, replenished with your food sources. Um, and then you can, but with, with having extra food, you can, mitigate that right and say okay yeah we have enough here here's some food for your for your ohana and then it, then it's less stress like you don't want to like give away all your food because then your own family will be will be at risk but at the same time as an entire community thinking about how not, not only to sustain yourself but everybody else as well um the one thing i mean We've we've looked into this a lot over the years. I'm not opposed to canned goods. So the idea when we got into it is canned goods are are great for an emergency, like or even maybe not the most healthiest food. Um, if you use it for just that for an emergency, just to get you through, and that's it. It's the unhealthiness of it shouldn't impact you that, that much. But what happens with canned goods is everyone will stock up on canned goods. And if you do buy canned goods, I would suggest um, buying things that you can open up and eat. So like soups, you know, that chicken noodle soup or anything you can just open up. If you don't have a heating source, you're not, you're not stuck with a, a can of, you know, uncooked food. Um, the thing with that is, if you get unhealthy canned food, um, they, they have a shelf life. So whenever you, any food that you get has shelf life. So it, what we were doing, we we're buying the cheap sale can, canned goods. Okay, we just put it away. In two years, we have to rotate through that food or else it would have spoiled. So then, you end up getting into this cycle if a hurricane never hits for years, then you get into this cycle where like, oh, every at least two years, you're cycling through all this, all this unhealthy food, right? And we didn't, we didn't really like that for our ohana. So what I ended up doing, um, well not, I mean, our ohana ended up doing, was we started canning our own foods. So, Canning is an entire process. And if you want to get into that, great. And I would say do, do a lot of research. There's a lot of really good videos out there. Um, but so we, we, I bought a canner. We started canning. So I started canning venison. So mm -hmm. had a bunch of canned venison and I just, just venison meat. Um, then we started canning um, canned ulu, canned palo. And were just things that, were readily available for us where everyone has someone who, who has an umu tree that goes off ridiculously one time of the year. And if you don't get it within those two to three weeks, it, it all spoils anyway, unless some people freeze them. But we wanted to try and see if we can ulu so that in an event, we could be eating healthy foods in this. All of this is already cooked, um, but 
you'd have to play around because the umu is still kind of it's not firm it's sitting in juice um but it's good in in like stir fries and so we wanted we wanted to try and go down that road and like be, become more self-sufficient but we still ran into the same problem this has a shelf life as well they say to rotate every one to two years i've eaten 10 year old canned venison i was fine but don't don't follow my lead. take the recommendation um but with that it's it still was it like the amount of work that we put into it the amount of funds that we put into it it didn't equate to like I didn't want to like put something away that you don't touch so that when you need it, it's actually there. Uh, I didn't want to put it away and have to rotate through it in a year or two. So there's other foods like peanut butter and honey that virtually, well, honey doesn't ever spoil, but peanut butter, if it's unopened, lasts for a really, really long time. But so what, what we found were these freeze dried meals. So we have these freeze dried meals and there's a, there's a few companies that sell them and virtually what they are is cooked food, cooked meals. So this is chili mac with beef, there's chicken teriyaki, there's, a, there's an entire assortment of, of meals. And so freeze drying is, it's like, is space food virtually. Um, and the idea with it is it there's a whole process on how it freezes it and sucks out the moisture. But this food right here, it's shelf stable for up to 25 to 30 years. So if I buy a canned soup for around maybe a little bit and maybe cheaper than this but I have to rotate through this every two years and I can just let this sit and not think about it for 30 years. This ends up becoming a more financial, like a smarter financial choice. Um, if you wanted to take it a step further, so this company is really good, Mountain House. They're a little bit pricey, but with that 30 year shelf life, you could go buy buckets to sell food buckets of these and you might spend a few thousand dollars getting enough food for you know a few like a month or two for your entire household um, but you never have to spend that money again for 30 years um there is a company now that that what we're trying to what we want to eventually buy is there's a company called harvest right and they sell freeze dryers so what people are doing is cooking their own food that they normally like and throwing, instead of having leftovers the next day, they throw everything else inside the food dryer and having their own meals. And you just buy Mylar bags and oxygen absorbers and you leave it in there. And it, it's a process as well. But it, what I'm saying is if you're gonna get into canning for food preservation or um, dehydrating, making jerky, all of it is a process. So in my thinking is if you're going to go through that process already, freeze drying is probably hands on the most benefit for the time you put into it. Um, but at least with a freeze dryer, you can determine what goes in, just like how we determine what went into these cans, you can determine what goes into these bags. So you could have, um, you could have your own meals. The, one of the other important things we took away from Hurricane Maria is when FEMA and all these relief efforts came in and they brought in rations for everyone. Rations didn't lift up. If, I don't know if you ever eaten an MRE, uh, military food, but they don't necessarily bring up your morale or your, you know, your, the psychological benefits of that food is very limited. Whereas if you had freeze-dried meals, which we've eaten a bunch of these and they taste exactly like the day you cooked it, pretty much. Um, a, I mean, that, that having a home-cooked meal will 
boost your self, not self-esteem, but it will boost your morale in your family after an event like that. And that's the big one that gets people is the psychological damage after an event of that magnitude. Um, yeah, by having clean water and you know, home style meals that you're used to, that your ohana is used to. Um, you could eat canned goods. I would say if your ohana isn't normally used to eating that type of food, have certain medicines to help you deal with like any gut issues. A lot of people don't think about that. It's you know laxatives or antidiuretics. Um, that's a it's a big it's a big issue when especially when you're eating ration food. Um, yeah. So with that, we go into so, oh, also if you're gonna store anything, food grade buckets are very good. Um, because we stored a lot of a lot of food in our cupboards and over time things just get to them. Um, here in Hawaii, we deal with so many pests, the cockroaches or, or bull weevils. Um, food grade buckets are great. Like another food grade bucket where another practice you should do is when you're going to the store, um, try and just buy whatever route you go. If you go canned goods or any type of food that you're going to get, whenever you go, just buy one extra thing or two extra things when you can. And then that way, it's not like you're just going one time and spending all this money, kind of break it up throughout the year. So like here, we'll have, I have some bag buckets with just a bunch of extra 20 pound bag of rice. Um, you want to think of like, again, on that, on that note of, you know, your, your psychological well-being is having things that would lift up if you have a ohana, like I have kids and having things that'll kind of get their mind off of things. So like we'll add in like cocoa, um, but like, like I said, honey, because it doesn't go bad. And after an event, having something sweet and still healthy um, goes a long way. Um, so with, with hurricane, if you want to go into kits, like I said, you want to you want to base your kit off of what event you're gonna do. So it might seem ridiculous, but having multiple different like kits. So we'll have a large a large kit. So like all of our food, all of our water, um, emergency equipment here in our home, and then we'll have a smaller version of all of that, just in case we have to leave. Um, so in our home. We'll have things um, like just tools, uh, things to kind of, we'll board up the house with. They, they suggest you have plyboard, three quarter inch plyboard for every window in your house. So it's, it'll be smart to pre-cut everything to each window in your house. So you're not trying to like figure it out while a storm is coming um and so that if it comes to the day prior and they're saying oh yeah it's going to be a big one category four five or three or whatever it is you're not at the last minute trying to trying to figure out all these measurements right you can just say okay this goes on this window this goes on that one and having just extra tools and knowing how to use knowing how to use the tools so having saws um, impact on Bunch of different size screws, uh, even uh, a big one is a tarp. Just having multiple tarps, actually. Just if something does happen, your roof flies off, or a portion of your roof flies off, and you have to retrofit it. After six months at, uh, in Maria or in Port Puerto Rico, all the tarps that they gave out, blue tarps, were deteriorating by that point. So it ended up becoming another issue of everybody had to get new tarps. But if you had you know, a few tarps set up in your shed that you can kind of mitigate that. Um, then, so there's a lot of different tools and I would say go 
there's a lot of good resources online. Um, YouTube has another prepping community that uh, has become kind of like a, I don't know, it's, it's a tinge to me. I, and everyone, my wife jokes about it, but everyone looks at you like, oh, you're a prepper. It's not like there's a, there are preppers out there. There's some pretty frantic people, but it's very smart to have just preparations and, you know, ready for a realistic event or a, a foreseen event. And being that, you know, we live in Hawaii, we have certain, certain natural events that do happen. Um, but having, you know, one of the first things is a good radio. Um, even though cell towers could be down, um, usually AM, FM radios, that's how the, the um, weather advisory system, they, they'll stay in contact with everyone. Um, these hand crank radios are great. They're, they're not that expensive. They'll, they'll take, this one is rechargeable and it has batteries too. Um, batteries, sorry. And for, for electronics, there's, there's a lot. So you can have, my suggestion would be to, if you're gonna get flashlights, it'd be really great to include headlamps. Um, in an event, you're probably gonna be using your hands at night, trying to, if, something happens to your roof or your structure and you have to go and fix it. You don't want to be holding a flashlight and working with one hand. With a headlamp, you have both hands free. Um, and we've gone through so many different headlamps. Um, whereas AAA, AA, we really like these. They're made, there's a bunch of different companies. Like this one is Night 4, but we like these because they're USB rechargeable and they last. That's really good. Um, that's a bunch of different modes, high beam, low beam, and a red light. So at night, you don't lose that, your um, night vision if you have to use your red light. And we'll have like battery backup banks. And this, this with that works really good. Um, having, so we, we used to buy a bunch of batteries instead of using those. So like, I have a bunch of batteries stored up. You can buy these containers so that you don't want batteries touching each other while they're stored because they'll, they can drain. But we ended up switching over to these. They're called antelope batteries, antelope. And you can buy them on Amazon, but they're AA, they have an assortment of batteries and they're rechargeable. Um, they last a really long time. And we bought a few of these packs and we haven't bought, we haven't bought batteries in, in years just because everything's in rechargeables now, which is great. Um, another good one. Well, anyway, there, there's, there's a lot of, of gear out there that, that you, you can get. Um, it's all dependent on what you need and what you're capable of using, right? So say like this, like I'll have a first aid kit. This is our home one. It's too big to carry in our stuff, but I'll have a first aid kit and try to get a pretty heavy duty one for our home. But with first aid kits is a perfect example of if you don't know how to use this in an event, it's good to have all of these things. But if you don't know how to use it, then it's hard, it's hard to, to use it. <laughs> um, so with that, it'll be smart to, if you're gonna get kit like this or any type of equipment to go and try and do extra learning, like how to, how to do you, like re-up on first aid every, every couple of years, um, CPR, all of those things are really useful to have. And it's, I mean, it all depends on how, how far you want to go with it. Um, like this, this is a tourniquet. It's a little tourniquet that I usually keep on me if, if I feel like 
there's a chance that you could need it. Like in an event like that, I would have this on top of me. So this is just to stop major bleeding on like a limb. There's a bunch of different tourniquets, but if you don't know how to use something like this, then I mean, if you do know how to use something like this, you could potentially save save your life, right? Um, okay, we'll we go into so I try to break it down where we'll have our things in our home to kind of like ride out the storm and ride out post event. Uh, if we do have to leave, everything switches to a mobile event, uh, a mobile situation. So like everything will go into our car. And with that, we stage all of our, all of our equipment in one area so that say for a tsunami, two tsunamis ago, it was our tsunami um, watches ago. Try to get everything into the car and I timed myself just to see and I took way too long and luckily a tsunami didn't come. But then after that, it really got me thinking like, oh, okay, we should, instead of running to different rooms in the house, have it, everything in one spot. So now this last tsunami watch, they were, everything was inside of our, our closet, um, one of our closets in our home. And within 15 minutes, everything was loaded. So it made a big difference having that organization in one spot. Um, you could, so with that, now instead of fortifying your home, you, you, you gotta start thinking about your house being home, right? So I usually have this in my van at all times. It's a bucket with a tool bag, but this is everything that I need to, for most cases, get my car unbroken on the side of the road and get home. It's not gonna, it's not gonna do any major diagnostic stuff, but in any event, that's the last thing you wanna do is you leave your house and your car breaks down. Um, so it just has a bunch of tools. And with that, like I'm also the family mechanic. So I have that skill set, right? Um, like pull straps, you know, this, everyone I think should have a good, um, let's see, it's like a, just a general tool set, mechanics, or even homeowners tool set that has all your wrenches, um, socket sets, Allen keys, and this right here, this little box has fixed many a car. And it's not that expensive on Amazon. Like there, there's a bunch of different ones. And same thing, you go to your skill level and what you feel comfortable with. Um, how I started was as a car would, something would happen to our car. Luckily I had an uncle that was a mechanic. I would take the car to him and ask him if he could help me fix it. But every time he would work on it, um, I would ask if I could work, work on it with him so that the next time it happens, I know how to fix it, right? And it's just taking that initiative um, to do that. I think everybody should at least know how to fix a flat tire, um, check all your fluids in your car. Tire pump is very useful. I never used to have one, now I do. And instead of trying to, like, if it's a small puncture, instead of trying to fix it on the side of the road, you just keep fitting it up every few miles ends up being a little quicker. Um, then we'll go into, so we'll have our backpack. So say our car breaks down, um, and I always carry at least one or two gallons of water in the car for either an overheated car, or we normally always use it to wash off at the beach. And I just keep refilling this and throwing it back in, but it's very useful if you have to drink water. Um, you want, as much of your kit, like once you start leaving your house, you have to start thinking about weight, size. Um, and then you, you wanna start thinking of things having multiple purpose, like this water, like having it for the car, but having it for us if we need it, or, you know, number of things. The more one thing can, can do multiple functions, the better. 
Um, then we go into bags. So if our car breaks down, then we have to throw bags on our back and start walking someplace. So I'll have something like this. Everyone in our house will have a bag. Um, I'll have majority of the things for, for everyone. And then each person, so I break it down into adult bags. So me, my wife, and our oldest son, they'll have their own bags. And in those bags, I'll, so I have something like this, like a bigger bag that carries more things. And this is um, my son Keoli's bag. And in those bags, we'll have multiple compartments. So for the adults, I like to have a, everybody should have a hat. So like after an event, it's very hot um, for weeks, usually very humid. Having a hat to keep you from getting sunburn on your head is very important, but it also helps regulate your body temperature. Um, toiletries, I'm not a big fanny pack kind of person, but if I did have to get out of my vehicle, I'll, I'll throw a fanny pack on. Just like the more things you can have on your body, the better. So that if something happens that like you fall in a river that's flooded and you lose your bag, you'll still have like, I always have a knife in my pocket. Oh, I think everyone should have a multi-tool so and know how to use it. So we like to teach our kids how to, how to use these things. It's kind of scary having them use a knife, but slowly getting them used to start them with a butter knife and work their way up. So our son knows how to use, he has his own multi-tools. Um, these are good because you have knives, you have saws, you have screwdrivers, and it's just, like I said, multiple uses in one, one thing. Um, so in this, in this fanny pack, this becomes, at that point, this becomes survival on the one. Like there's, there's many different, um, ideologies on like survival, like there's a bunch of different survival schools and we're kind of into it. Uh, so the things that the biggest things should have is a knife, cordage, um, rain protection, or like a good one if you had to carry it. All of our kits have, so all of our kits have this, but all of our kids have plastic trash bags, large trash bags. This has so many uses, like in an emergency, you could use it as a tarp to go over you. You can use it to lay on. Um, you can even poke a hole on the bottom and use it as a poncho, very useful. Um, I'll have duct tape. Um, I usually have, in all of our packs, we'll have some snacks, just, just so as we're walking, we don't have to stop. And we have a snack on us, just pull it out. Um, Realistically, we probably won't walk too far from where we where we have we have a lot of friends and family around us. Uh, but just in case, uh, let's see, this is another good one. I never knew about this. This is called a Silcox key, and you can find it on Amazon. I bought a two pack of this, but this has all the different. Um, this is a key, a universal key for all the different water water um, spigots. So it, throughout like min, municipal water spigots, like if they won't have a handle on it, you can turn it on with this or any of it, turn it off. So if, if there's like pipes that are broken that are raging and you can actually find, find the area that turn it off, you could save a bunch of water. Or if you needed to, you could turn on water and like use it for an emergency. I wouldn't suggest using it outside of your, uh, outside of an emergency, because I don't know the legalities of that, but we'll have it in this kit. Um, everybody will have their own medical kits on hand, first aid. The one suggestion I would say is tailor this per bag. Um, like this one, I'll, this is in my son's one, but this is actually the kids. I'll usually carry this. And with this, um, they have every they have different needs. So for the kids, we have a lot of, we thought about it a lot and like just having, you know, kids ibuprofen, kids Tylenol. We usually do a bunch of lao and, and 
essential oils first, but in an emergency kit. Like we said, we're not opposed to to doing like things that we normally wouldn't do, like healthy healthier choices. But in an emergency, it's good to have these things because these are more shelf stable than some of the things we do have on our day to day basis. Um, I would say one suggestion is have kids melatonin or something like because if if we're out of our house we usually take a tent i'll have a tent um we have a tent bag and so we're virtually camping right um if say in that situation kids are freaked out they can't sleep or they're having a hard time or they start getting sick and it's best for them to sleep something to help them do that even for for adults is really good um again diuretics anti-diuretics like those anything to work on if someone going back to multiple uses um i'm always thinking in our medical kits is um like major major bleeding so if somebody gets cut or we get into a car accident having stuff to stop bleeding in that emergency you i mean you don't want to get cut at all you don't you know, don't want to get infections but especially the, the huge bleeding, a multi-purpose for us, women's menstrual pads, um, they're really good at stopping bleeding. But then if say um, somebody needs it for normal reasons, you have it there as well. My wife giggled at that one the first time she saw it, but I think it makes sense. Um, all of our all of our bags have some type of metal container, so that if we lose this, if we lose this, I can always take this metal container, fill it up with water, and boil it. Everybody has a way to make fire. Everybody has lighters, um, lighters, knives, a few tools, but pretty much, pretty much that you can get these space blankets too. They're 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 good. Most of the space blankets are single use. So just know that. And I hear a lot of people say, we'll get space blankets and those cheap ponchos. But if you ever used one, like actually tried to use one, they rip very easily. Um, there's a few companies that sell heavy duty ones. Those are good. Yeah. And there's, especially in the last few years, uh, the preparedness community has come a long way. Um, Another good first, uh, good thing to think about for your kids, if you have kids, is having things that they can do in an event. So for me, I feel like post-event, natural disaster, I would probably, my skill set, I'll probably go and see where I can help in the community. Um, so another thing you should think about is having tools to, there's going to be a lot of cleanup after a big event. So having tools to help out with that. Um, shovels, rakes. Um, chainsaws like there's gonna be a lot of down trees um just be careful after an event if you are going to help clean up i would say do it in a community effort where there's some organization the last thing you want to do is go out and be gung ho and fixing someone's roof or and get hurt um emergency personnel are probably going to be swamped with with other cases so you don't want to add to that especially nowadays like with with a pandemic going on like the last thing you want to do is have to be sent to the hospital um so having like work gloves you know proper footwear all of those things come into play um but having things for the kids is a good one so we'll have like coloring books in their bags we'll have you know they'll Depends how bad it is, but we'll have, we'll have their iPad um, if we have power. Just something to keep their mind busy while like we're doing stuff. We'll have somebody watching them, and like, so I'll, I might go out and help. Um, but yeah, just keeping everybody from thinking too hard on, on everything. Um, okay. Aloha, sorry. Jackie. No. <laughs> Um, we are at our four o'clock hour, and we oh. are so appreciative of all the Ike and sharing that you um, provided today. Did you um, 
did you want to leave the audience with any last last thoughts last but not all um yeah, just kind of like what i was reiterating um oh so the big thing after an event is i would say is to have community so building community now and having that having that backup after the event so having like this instead of buying food and goods and stuff having a local farmer or a local rancher that you know that you can go and make a relationship now so in any event happens like that and say there isn't food to go get at the grocery store you already have that connection with the source and most times it'll be more beneficial to him to sell direct to you and more beneficial for you to buy direct so having whatever if it's a cattle farmer or a rancher or a tomato farmer or somebody with tree uh, fruit trees make those connections now because it'll only buffer the entire system when an event happens and an event will eventually happen um so getting ready for those things and like and it, it just helps the whole community even without the event as well i think that's a really important thing to think about that mahalo Hi. Um, uh, I love that we we ended with the importance of building community and and making relationships with farmers and and other growers so that um, that we all have access to to healthy foods, support each other, and even the the point that you made about having the Berkey to be the hub that can be used for other community members who don't have access to that kind of equipment and um, filtration system is really important. Uh, so mahalo nui. If anybody had questions, you can throw them in the chat now. I'm just gonna share um, real quick our other our other webinars um, next week Saturday. So on the twenty oh, oops sorry the twenty first, uh, we're gonna have Kaiulani Odom, and she's gonna um, kind of do like a little cooking show to show how she, how you can prepare your uh, hurricane kit foods in a healthier way for yourself and your ohana. And the uh, last Saturday of August, we have Dr. Katie Camella Mella um, talking about financial peace preparedness. Uh, she's gonna be talking about insurance, um, the different kinds of disaster insurances that you can have to protect yourself and your property. So like um, fire insurance, hurricane insurance, um, and whatnot. So you can use the same um, the same website, the bitly at uh, bitly slash bilihua to uh, register for these other two webinars. And no questions. We have mahalo nui from our audience members. Mahalo to those on Facebook and mahalo to Kiahi and your ohana for lending you out to join us today and uh, share with us your your prepping tips mahalo guys mahalo Thank you so much Mahalo for taking the time out. Oh yeah, you it's good.